Penelope was shocked when Penel informed her that Eklis had not returned home. Despite completing his usual training, panic surged through her as she feared he had run away. Eklis, after all, had the highest favorability score, making him crucial to her plans. Her mind spun with countless scenarios and reasons, but she reminded herself not to jump to conclusions. If Eklis truly wanted to escape, he wouldn't have refused to remove the chalker. She instructed Penel to keep this information secret, deciding to wait for Eklis to return on his own. After some time, Eklis returned and knelt before her, apologizing and asking if she had been worried. Penelope knew the real princess would arrive in three weeks, so she needed to secure Eklis's favor to break free from her cursed destiny and achieve a happy ending. Eklis explained his delay. He had encountered someone from his village, Delman, who was also working as a slave. During their conversation, a monstrous creature attacked the slave. In the town filled with slaves, no one dared to help. Eklis, armed with a sword, took it upon himself to slay the creature. He succeeded, but spent time aiding the injured, which caused his late return. The princess warned him to be cautious in the future and to return home safely for help because she worried about him a lot. The sweet boy eager to be useful, asked if he was worthy. The princess pulled him close, declaring that he was very important to her. As she had planned, her words raised Eklis's favorability score to 94%, leaving her just six more points to win. On the other hand, Eklis knew that despite his efforts, he couldn't find warmth in her eyes. He was aware that she had bought him at a high price for a specific purpose, yet he remained genuine in his feelings. Initially, he had planned to betray her, searching for the right moment to escape. However, each time she smiled at him, his resolve crumbled. Whenever she whispered to him, he desperately wanted to stay by her side. Her declaration that he was important lingered in his mind, deepening his obsession with her. His love for his master was transforming into an obsession, its nature whether good or bad yet to be determined. While training, Eklis sensed Penelope's presence. Turning, he saw her standing behind him offering herbs and medicine for his injuries. This caring gesture increased his favorability to 96%. Penelope wished to spend more time with him to further raise his score, but Penel informed her of the Crown Prince's aide's visit to the mansion. Fearful of potential trouble on Soleil Island and worried about what Callisto might know, she hurried to the scene. However, she was stopped by Eklis's angry voice and piercing, tear-filled eyes, surprising Penelope. Eklis was furious, feeling abandoned just when she had come to visit him. Despite her promise to return quickly, Eklis seemed like a different person. Penel advised Penelope to be cautious and keep Eklis in his place, but the princess ordered Penel not to visit him without her permission. Back at the mansion, Cedric brought a message along with a gift from Crown Prince Callisto. It was revealed that his birthday was approaching, and he had sent a specially selected gift for Penelope, which he wanted her to wear on the day of his celebration. It was a beautiful dress, as expected from the choice of the legendary crown prince. His affection shone through the exquisite garment, though no one else could see it. Designed with pure gold and adorned with rare blue diamonds, the dress left everyone in awe. Penelope, however, was puzzled and asked why the crown prince had gifted her the dress for his birthday. Cedric explained that she would be his partner at the upcoming banquet, a revelation that left Penelope shocked, even though it seemed as though she should have known. Penelope wanted to return the gift, but the ever-perceptive Callisto had anticipated her reaction. He had instructed Cedric to relay a message. If Penelope refused the gift, she should be told it was a repayment for her heroic actions in saving his life. Callisto had prepared for all her possible refusals, leaving Penelope with no choice but to accept. After all, who could win against Callisto? Reluctantly, she accepted the dress but sent a message that she might not attend the banquet due to the risk of falling ill, a condition Callisto knew well. Shortly after, Penelope inquired about Eklis, only to learn that he was in the swordsmanship class. She decided not to disturb his training but sent a message for him to visit her as soon as he was free. However, Eklis began avoiding her, making it difficult for Penel to even deliver the princess's message. The morning of the banquet dawned, and the maids were excited, thinking the princess would wear the beautiful dress sent by the crown prince. However, Penelope chose to wear a simpler dress. She didn't want to stand out, knowing she planned to visit briefly and leave. More importantly, she didn't want to give Callisto false hopes or entangle him in her life, especially with Eklis's favorability nearly maxed out, signaling the end was near. Her brothers, assuming she hadn't received an invitation for a partner, 
planned to accompany her to prevent any embarrassment. Her father decided to escort her, and she entered the hall happily with him. As soon as she entered, she spotted Winter, and suddenly, a quest appeared, offering her the option to dance with a man and earn up to five additional favorability points. She initially rejected it. Surprisingly, Derek then asked her to dance. Seeing an opportunity to complete the quest, she decided it was a good idea. As she extended her hand, someone grabbed her from behind, pulling her close by the waist. The man declared that he had decided to dance with her, and to her astonishment, it was none other than the charming, golden-haired Crown Prince Callisto. Watching the Crown Prince's hands on her waist, Derek stepped forward, demanding he release her. Derek warned him to be cautious, as he hadn't officially asked her to be his partner. But the Crown Prince surprised him, revealing that he had already sent a proposal through his aide, which she had accepted. Penelope knew this wasn't true, but Callisto whispered in her ear, threatening to reveal her secret heroic actions in Solisle if she refused. Reluctantly, she calmed her brother. Penelope refused to dance, but Callisto, with pleading eyes, grabbed her clothes and asked how he would feel if people talked about being refused by his dancing partner on his birthday. Making Penelope's heart dance was no small feat, but with Callisto asking, the competition was even. The charming prince pulled her into a hug and placed her feet on his, struggling to maintain her balance. Penelope found it hard to dance, but Callisto laughed, guiding her with ease. His joy was evident as he gently led her through the dance, making her movements seem graceful despite her inexperience. And just like that, the quest was accepted and Penelope fumed at the system for not letting her smoothly skip the event. To calm down, she went to the balcony for some fresh air, only to be interrupted by the crown prince, who had followed her and was frowning at her for leaving the event so abruptly. After their banter, she finally let him in, and he asked the most expected question. Why hadn't she worn the dress he sent? She had an excuse ready, saying she would wear it another time, but the prince knew her too well. He realized she didn't want to attract attention which made him ponder how she liked diamond mines but not diamond dresses. To this, she asked him to forget the event and everything that happened that day, to which he replied how he could forget the fact that their lips had touched twice. Panicking at the unexpected statement, she hurriedly said she meant the Solisle event. She also requested that he keep the event secret from her father, which he already knew she wanted. He had known she wouldn't disclose it and wouldn't wear the dress, but he had sent the gift anyway because, when he saw the dress, he immediately imagined her in it. Lastly, he asked if she had brought a gift. After all, it was his birthday. Initially, she said her dance was a gift, but when he insisted, she tossed the gift toward him. It was ruby cufflinks with a healing spell that would work until they broke. She had gifted them so he wouldn't complain to her that she couldn't use healing magic next time. The crown prince, with a mischievous glint, intentionally pierced one in his ear so he could use it whenever he wanted. She called him strange, and he agreed, but in the most unexpected way, saying it was better for two strange folks like them to be together. He then proposed that they date officially. He wanted to turn the rumors into reality and start an official relationship with her. Penelope was baffled, unable to comprehend how things had escalated so quickly. Callisto, however, was determined. He even offered to let her cut his throat, just as he had done when they first met, to make things equal but she refused, of course. With Callisto's favorability score at 76%, Penelope finally asked him if he loved her. Callisto was taken aback because he believed she needed a realistic partner who would stand by her. He thought they were a perfect match, knowing she would have to marry someone after her coming-of-age ceremony, so why not consider him? Penelope was confused, uncertain whether her feelings for him were genuine love or just a crush. Ultimately, she decided to label both her feelings and his as a crush. She didn't want to risk her life for the sake of her feelings, especially with Callisto's favorability at 76% compared to Eclis's 96%. Suddenly, the emperor entered the banquet, requiring Callisto's presence, so he couldn't stay with her any longer. She rejected his proposal, but he gave her time to think until her coming-of-age ceremony. When she insisted there was nothing to think about, he placed his hand on her mouth, saying he didn't want to be rejected on his birthday. He left without waiting for her answer, planning to hear it at her coming-of-age ceremony. She left alone for her mansion, where she encountered Pio. 
the bird whose feathers matched her hair. She felt a deep connection with the bird, trapped in a cage, just as she felt trapped in a game world designed for Penelope. She couldn't do as she pleased and was forced to make tough choices. Her eyes filled with tears, but just then she heard Eklis's voice from behind and quickly wiped them away, pretending everything was fine. Eklis sensed something was wrong and became furious, cursing her father and brothers for bringing sadness to her face. Penelope tried to calm him, insisting there was nothing to worry about. He could tell she was unhappy and feared she might disappear. His statement shocked Penelope. He then offered to run away with her, as a group of slaves was planning an escape to another country. She asked him not to bring up the idea again, knowing deep down that as a noble woman they would be caught if they tried to flee. Unsure of how the hard mode would end and what challenges it would bring, Penelope put all her hopes in Eklis, asking him to be strong enough to protect her. Eklis's favorability score skyrocketed to 99%, and she vowed to make it 100 before the coming-of-age ceremony. She tried everything to raise the score, but she failed to make him confess his love, which was necessary to reach 100. While reading the system rules and possibilities of a confession, she realized that the heart symbol for a 100% score was different for Eklis. It was dark, not red. She feared that the dark color might signify revenge or blood. Brushing off these thoughts, she was interrupted by Pennell, who informed her that the Duke wanted to have breakfast with her. Pennell also informed her of a letter from the Crown Prince, sent directly through his servant. However, Penelope ordered him to burn the letter and do the same with any future correspondence without informing her. The anticipated breakfast meeting arrived, and her father asked if she needed anything for her coming-of-age ceremony. She refused, saying she had everything she needed. When her brothers and father insisted, she asked her father to visit her in the morning to say goodbye to his immature daughter, surprising everyone. She quickly covered it up, explaining she would be an adult then. While they were enjoying their meal, Pennell suddenly rushed in, requesting the Duke's presence outside. He whispered something in the Duke's ear, causing him to rush out, leaving everyone at the table surprised. Penelope feared it was Callisto, upset about his rejected letter. However, it turned out to be Ivone, the real daughter of the Eckhart family. Penelope was shocked. There were still five days left before her coming-of-age ceremony, and she hadn't expected Ivone to arrive early. The Duke wanted to test if the girl was truly his daughter, as many had tried to deceive him before. To Penelope's further shock, Eklis was standing behind Ivone, indicating he had let her in. When the Duke ordered Eklis to be locked up, Ivone requested mercy, explaining that Eklis had helped her. Penelope decided to deal with Eklis herself. Furious, she demanded why he had betrayed her by bringing the real daughter to the family. Eklis explained that he was indebted to the Eckhart family and knew they were searching for their real daughter, so he found her. Enraged, Penelope reminded him that he was indebted to her, as she was the one who had brought him here. In her fury, she almost raised her hand to slap him but was stopped by her father and Derek. Derek, angry and exasperated, said he was tired of her childish actions. Penelope realized that things had become much tougher now that she was no longer the main character in the story. She realized people were shifting their attention towards the real daughter, including her maid Emily. With her plans ruined by Eklis's betrayal, Penelope struggled to figure out her next move. Despite everything, she hadn't given up hope on Eklis. She was determined to get his love confession to turn his favorability score to 100, enabling her to escape the game. Amidst the chaos, Pennell finally brought some good news. The White Rabbit Company had deposited the money from the auction of the first emerald item. She was about to visit Eklis to secure his confession by any means necessary but was stopped by Pennell, who introduced two new escorts, Phillips and Ed. Both were part of the Duke's direct guard unit and possessed excellent sword skills. It turned out the Duke had prohibited her from contacting anyone outside the family, including Eklis, to protect her until the investigation was over. Pennell explained that the young Duke himself was investigating the monster incident Eklis had mentioned. In that incident, Ivone was greatly affected, but the slaves from Delman took care of the injured guests. Pennell also revealed that the Delman people were planning an exile, exactly as Eklis had told Penelope. The young Duke, aware of this, had gone to make an emergency arrest. Penelope was shocked to learn that Eklis had revealed all the details himself during the investigation, including how the herbs she gave him became the basis for their escape plan. He had tried to dissuade them when he realized her kindness was being exploited. He then met Ivone and decided to repay the Duke's favor by bringing her back. 
Penelope was stunned, wondering why Eccles would betray the people he once cared so much about and even offer her a chance to run away with them. She realized Eccles had hidden his true feelings, imitating a loyal servant until he found an opportunity to sacrifice the people of his hometown and bring the real princess back to rise in social status. To avoid suspicion of being in cahoots with the slaves, he cleverly tried to involve Penelope. For now, she had to wait for the investigation to end before she could meet her father or Eccles. Feeling helpless and betrayed, she didn't give up. The next morning, she went to breathe fresh air in the garden after warning her new escorts not to follow her. While figuring out where they might have locked Eccles, she encountered Ivone. The real villainous daughter was on her way to meet Eccles. When Penelope asked why she was alone, Ivone said her maid was busy. Pretending to be kind, Ivone apologized to Penelope, even holding her from behind. Penelope told her not to bother her, but when Ivone slipped, Penelope caught her and noticed her hands were cold as the dead. Penelope made it clear that she had no interest in why Ivone returned or whether she was the real daughter. She warned Ivone not to touch her again or risk being slapped. Just then, Rinald, her pink-haired brother, overheard the conversation and misunderstood the situation. Angry, he questioned why Penelope was touching Ivone, but she explained that she was helping her from falling. His cold statement made Penelope realize that nothing had changed. He was still the same. However, Rinald quickly realized his mistake and apologized, as if someone had magically forced him to speak harshly. Even Rinald seemed shocked by his behavior. Nonetheless, Penelope decided not to meet with him for the time being. Penelope couldn't sleep peacefully and hadn't eaten for over 24 hours when her maid Emily came to wake her up. Emily informed her that Ivone had lost her memory and couldn't answer all the questions of the test, so she was ordered to stay in the mansion for the time being. Fearing that Emily might leave her for the real daughter, Penelope kicked her out of the room, not wanting to hear her departure. Contrary to her expectations, Emily remained loyal and assured her that she would report every move Ivone made, knowing Becky, the maid assigned to Ivone. Penelope ordered Emily to only report anything suspicious, and Emily understood the assignment. When asked why she wanted to stay, Emily explained that Penelope was the only person who recognized her worth. She had always been disliked in her maid career, but Penelope had understood and been kind to her. Three days before the coming-of-age ceremony, Penelope's father called her. The Duke informed her that the slaves planning to escape were caught by Derek and would be executed. However, the herbs Penelope had sent funded their escape plan. Feeling guilty, Penelope was ready for any punishment. But the Duke, having heard everything from Penel, knew she had acted out of compassion for the injured. The Duke sought Penelope's permission to let Ivone stay as she had answered all the questions correctly. He kindly offered to send Ivone elsewhere if Penelope was uncomfortable. However, Penelope, like the heroine she was, congratulated him on finding the real daughter and assured him she wouldn't make a fuss about Ivone's presence. She promised to leave the mansion once Ivone's identity was confirmed and reassured the Duke that she wouldn't harm Ivone, implying the reason for her new escorts. The Duke was taken aback and tried to clarify, but Penelope's observations were accurate. She thanked her father for everything and requested that he not give her things to Ivone, specifically asking for Eccles to be returned to her. She still hoped he would help her escape. However, the Duke expressed his dislike for Eccles, and Derek added that he had heard strange things about Eccles from other slaves. They revealed that Eccles had advised them to sell the herbs to fund their escape. Despite this, because Eccles had brought the real daughter to the mansion, the Eckhart family felt indebted to him. When asked if he wanted anything in return, Eccles surprisingly requested only to learn more about swordsmanship and not to be kicked out of the Duke's residence. The Duke still asked if she wanted to keep such a person by her side, and Penelope wasn't sure what was going on in Eccles's head. She requested to meet Eccles, but her father was concerned that rumors might spread, affecting her coming-of-age ceremony. Shockingly, Penelope asked to cancel the ceremony hoping that postponing it might delay the game's mode, giving her more time to find a way to escape, even if it wouldn't be through Eccles. Regardless, he decided not to cancel the ceremony. When Penelope returned to her room, Emily reported that Ivone had toured the mansion with the head maid during the day and went for a walk alone at night in the forest near the training ground, suggesting she might have gone to meet Eccles. At that moment, Ivone was having refreshments with the little duke, Derek. Penelope suddenly had an idea and whispered it to Emily. Next, Emily brought her servant clothes, but Penelope decided to disguise herself as a male servant to avoid suspicion. 
Using magic, Penelope became unrecognizable and asked Emily to remember her face because she would return in the same guise. She then left through the window, using the ropes she had spent the whole day tying together. This was the only way she could visit Eklis. As she was leaving, a system notification popped up. It was a quest to visit one of the targets, and she selected Eklis. She reached the place where he was in prison, determined to find answers and possibly secure her escape. On her way to Eklis, Penelope bumped into Derek. Thanks to her quick thinking, she had already prepared an excuse and managed to keep her identity hidden. When she finally confronted Eklis, she demanded an explanation for his betrayal, accusing him of wanting to replace her with Ivone as his new master. Eklis responded that his status would soon be elevated to a commoner, meaning he wouldn't need a master anymore. She asked why he hadn't asked for anything from Derek, to which he replied that his true desire was to stay in the mansion by her side. He revealed that he had orchestrated everything so that Penelope could escape a house where she was not respected. He knew that if Ivone entered, Penelope would have to leave, and he planned to stay with her far from the Eckhart family. If she insisted on staying, he was even willing to kill Ivone to ensure she remained the real princess. His obsession for Penelope had taken over him entirely. Eklis finally said the words Penelope had longed to hear, I love you, but his favorability score still stayed at 99. He declared that he wanted her and that she had driven him mad with desire. In a decisive move, Penelope punished him by throwing away the controlling ring, proclaiming that betrayal meant death, and from now on, Eklis was dead to her. She didn't want a dog that would bite its master. Eklis was shocked because he never thought Penelope would ever abandon him like that. As soon as she left, Ivone entered to meet Eklis, revealing that it was her brainwashing that led him to bring her to the palace and sacrifice his people. She had convinced him that if he didn't become a sword master and do what he had done, Penelope would be disappointed in him. Eklis fell prey to Ivone's manipulations, believing that earning Penelope's love as a knight, rather than a slave, would keep him by her side forever. Ivone made him believe that only she understood his feelings for his master and tried countless times to make Eklis hate Penelope, but he couldn't get over her. Add heading when Ivone mentioned she was still searching for the other half of a shard, the scene shifted to Penelope, who was eavesdropping on their conversation. She realized that everything she had seen in Solisle was not an illusion and that Ivone was the mastermind behind the evil things she faced. She figured out that the shard Ivone had was an artifact used to manipulate people's minds. This explained why Derek and Rinald seemed to be under a spell it was Ivone's doing. Unable to sleep all night, knowing that only three days remained until the coming of age ceremony and fearing for her life, Penelope sent Emily to the Rabbit Guild early in the morning to demand something from the Guild Master. Luckily, she had a loyal servant she could trust. After sending Emily on the mission, Penelope went to the glass chamber to breathe peacefully, strictly prohibiting the escorts from disturbing her or letting anyone enter. While resting on the grass with her eyes closed, she sensed someone's presence and said that no one was allowed there without opening her eyes. But then she heard a voice saying, not even the royal family? Shocked. She opened her eyes to see the charming crown prince Callisto standing in front of her. He further took her breath away by saying, how are you up when I haven't even kissed you yet? Penelope's voice was icy as she asked how the sun-haired man had managed to get past her loyal guards. He shrugged nonchalantly explaining that he had simply knocked them out to gain entry. Her eyes narrowed as she demanded to know his reason for visiting. With a smirk, he replied that he was there to see his fianchi. Penelope, unimpressed, retorted with a sarcastic query about which of her brothers he was engaged to. Callisto frowned, calling it a bad joke. He revealed that he had brought gifts for her coming-of-age ceremony and since there were so many, he had come early to deliver them himself. Penelope, still skeptical, pointed out that he could have sent an aide, as he had done before. He called her thick-headed for not grasping the obvious that he had come personally to see her. Ad heading Penelope offered him a seat, but instead, he grasped her hand, his face darkening with anger. He asked if her family was in financial trouble or treating her poorly. Confused by his fury, she stared at him, unable to understand his concern. He demanded to know why she looked so unwell, certain that something was troubling her. He told her to pack her bags, declaring that he would take her to the palace. She refused, insisting she would not leave. Frustrated, he said he couldn't let her die here. Penelope, her voice hollow with despair, asked why it mattered to him if she died. 
She had lost hope and questioned him without hesitation. Then, with a resigned air, she brought up their engagement and rejected him once more. Callisto was stunned, unable to comprehend her reasoning. She claimed they were not suitable partners, and he argued that it was better to start a life with him than with a stranger. Penelope explained that since Ivone had returned, her status would no longer benefit his. Callisto, however, made it clear that he wanted her, not any status. Though she knew they had feelings for each other, she dismissed them as a mere crush, believing they could never transform into love. She told him she wanted someone who loved her enough to rescue her from this hell, knowing it was not her story. She insisted he wasn't the one for her and suggested he marry Ivone instead. Callisto, feeling insulted by her matchmaking, was furious. Penelope stated coldly that she needed real love, not a loveless relationship. Heartbroken, Callisto left, as he had believed she shared his feelings. As he exited, he encountered Ivone, who grabbed his clothes to stop him, just as she had done with Penelope. Callisto, mistaking her for a maid, drew his sword, but remembering Penelope, decided against causing a scene. Ivone approached Penelope, complaining that the crown prince had injured her. Her feigned kindness grated on Penelope's nerves, her persistent questions and interference proving to be equally irritating. As Ivone entered the house, her eyes scanned the room filled with gifts. She assumed they were from the Eckhart family, intended for her. However, when Penelope clarified that the gifts were actually for her and had been sent by Callisto, her eyes widened in shock. Callisto had seemingly spared no expense, ensuring Penelope received everything imaginable. Exhausted, Penelope asked the butler to organize the gifts, then retreated to her room. There, she encountered Emily, who handed her the potion Penelope had requested from the Rabbit Kingdom. Finally, the day of her coming-of-age ceremony arrived, and the maids were bustling about, preparing Penelope for her big day. On their recommendation, Penelope wore the dress Callisto had gifted her for his birthday. Confident that the crown prince whom she had explicitly forbidden from approaching her wouldn't attend the ceremony, she decided to wear the dress, thinking it might be her last day. Penelope looked stunning, and everyone was mesmerized by her appearance. The ceremony was set to start at noon. Early in the morning, Emily informed Penelope that Ivone and Derek were busy having tea. She also mentioned Becky's suspicious activity, noting that Becky had asked for directions to the Merchant Street the previous night. Penelope suspected Ivone was up to something. She opened her drawer, searching for the potion she had received from Vinter, and found the necklace he had given her. The necklace began to glow red, indicating that the potion contained something highly toxic. Suddenly, a realization struck her. The dark red color of Eklis's heart symbolized toxicity and a relentless love that would possess her, even to the point of killing her. Just then, a knock on the door pulled her out of her thoughts. It was her father, visiting her at her request. His father was always so generous and benevolent towards Penelope, and she felt a pang of guilt for his troubled life following Ivone's arrival. When the Duke noticed the necklace Vinter had given her, he inquired about its beauty. To avoid delving into the details, she hastily put it on. The Duke apologized for assigning her guards, but she reassured him that she understood. She assumed he was worried she might harm Ivone. To her surprise, the Duke explained that the guards were assigned solely for her protection, considering how dangerous Eklis was. He revealed that Rinald had confessed, right after the hunting competition, that when they were children, Penelope had never stolen Ivone's necklace. It had been Rinald who fabricated the story. Penelope was astonished because in the game, Rinald had never confessed. This heart-to-heart -heart talk between father and daughter highlighted the Duke's unwavering support and deep love for Penelope. She realized just how much he truly cared for her, reinforcing the bond between them. When Penelope asked the Duke to cancel the ceremony because of Ivone's presence, he became angry. He still held the same love for Penelope and wanted her ceremony to be splendid, free from Ivone's interference. Tears welled up in her eyes as she realized the depth of his love for her, and they shared a beautiful hug. Finally, the time for the ceremony arrived, and the Lady of the Day entered the scene with her maid, Emily. Rinald and Penelope exchanged playful banter, just like brother and sister. This time, Rinald brought a cute gift for his sister, adding a touch of warmth and familial affection to the occasion. When Rinald left, Penelope noticed Vinder sitting nearby and turned to hide the necklace he had given her. However, before she could, someone called her princess from behind. It wasn't Vinder. 
but the crown prince, Callisto. After greeting him, Penelope reminded him of her warning, but he ignored it and complimented her beauty, saying she was more stunning than he had imagined. Noticing the necklace, Callisto asked about it, remembering she wore it in Solisle. She told him it was a gift from Vinter. Callisto stepped closer to inspect her hair, which was shining brilliantly, startling Penelope with his proximity. Suddenly, a system notification popped up, prompting her to check Callisto's favorability. Considering it might be her last chance, she saw it was at 89%. Their moment was interrupted by greetings from the Duke and Rinald. Callisto wished the princess a happy birthday and then left the scene. The ceremony began, following traditions, and it was time to drink the sherry. The Duke wondered aloud where Derek was. As they waited for him, gossip began to spread. To avoid wasting time, the Duke ordered the ceremony to continue. Knowing Penelope wouldn't like the taste of the sherry, the Duke discreetly advised her to dispose of it, which she did smoothly. Just as the Duke was thanking the guests, the gossip grew louder with Derek's arrival, bringing Ivone with him. The Duke was furious. But Derek introduced Ivone with such confidence that it was clear he believed he was doing the right thing. Derek was completely brainwashed by the villainous, and his actions added tension to the already charged atmosphere. 